Okay. Welcome back, everybody, to our sec second lecture on uh, BC 308, Revelation and Daniel. We are going to get started looking into Daniel. So let's, you know, I, I hope all of us have our Bibles with us because we're going to read the read through all the prophetic text in Daniel uh, each class and then uh, we will take time to understand that. So Daniel chapter 2, um, we are all familiar with the background of the story but just to uh, review it, uh, at this time Daniel is serving in uh, the courts of King Nebuchadnezzar so one day Nebuchadnezzar wakes up, he says, I know I had a dream, but I don't know what the dream is. So he calls all the wise men in his uh, courts. He says, I want all of you uh, to find out what is the dream. I had a dream. I want you to find out what is the dream. And I want you to tell me the meaning of the dream. So it's a double challenge because, first of all, the king, he, 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 he probably doesn't remember the dream properly. He knows he had a dream. So it's a double challenge. You have to tell him what the dream is, and you also tell them meaning. And if you don't, you're going to be killed. And then take this seriously. You better tell me. You better get to work and tell me what my dream was and what is the meaning of the dream. So uh, none of them are able to do it. And the king's order is, if you don't do it, you're going to be killed. So it's a very, very difficult situation. And it's at this time that Daniel, you know, goes to the commander in chief and says, just give me one night, uh, come back, uh, you know, don't carry out the execution of anyone now. And that night, Daniel goes along with his friends. Uh, they pray and God speaks to Daniel and God reveals in a dream, he reveals to Daniel the dream and the meaning of it. Right? So that's, and then the, Daniel goes and he presents that to the king. So we're going to we're going to focus in on the me the dream and the meaning of the dream. We will uh, we will read just that part. So we're going to read Daniel chapter two, verses thirty one to forty. Um, let's say uh, forty five. Daniel chapter two thirty one to 45. Uh, we will, you know, I'd just like to uh, invite people, uh, students in the class, uh, if each of us can just take turns and read uh, two verses each, right? Anybody can start and there's no particular order. Uh, two verses each, Daniel chapter 2, 31 to 45. Uh, let's read it quickly and let's try to understand it, please. Anyone can start. You, O King, we are watching and behold a great image. This great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome. This image's head was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its berry and thighs of bronze. Its leg of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay, you watched while a stone was cut out with, without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay, and it and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the iron, then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together, and became like chaff from the summer, threshing from the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we tell, now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. Uh, 
But after you shall arise another kingdom in birth to yours, then another a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, as much as iron breaks into pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes the kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Verse 41, whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that, the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. So, let me just share the notes here. So, this is an amazing. Uh, you know, a start to what we are going to see it in the book of Daniel, and oh, and I'm just going into, uh, I'm just putting the image there on the on, on sharing the image that's in the notes. So Daniel uh, receives from God the dream and the interpretation, and so he tells the dream. It says. King, you saw a big image. Uh, you know, yeah, some, somebody has you know, created this paint, this drawing, uh, which is useful. And each part of this image was made of different metal. Interesting. Okay. The head was gold. Uh, uh, this is Daniel chapter 2, verse 32. The chest part was silver. The thigh part, was of uh, brass or bronze. Uh, the feet, uh, the legs were of iron, and the feet was a mix of iron and clay. Right. So he says, King, you saw this image, and again, a very strange. This is so we call this prophetic imagery, meaning God is speaking through the image. He's giving message. He's giving a message through the image. So when we, you know, there are times when God will speak to us uh, in dreams or in visions, and he gives us images, he gives us pictures, and the pictures have meaning, and this is a beautiful example. And so King Nebuchadnezzar is seeing this image, and, you know, we can try to imagine this. Okay, you know, in the dream, he sees this image, gold, silver, bronze, iron, and very strange, the feet and the toes, are a mix of iron and clay. But there is meaning to all of this. And then he sees this huge round rock coming from the heavens. It is not, it is not cut out with men's hands, meaning it is something heavenly, you know, it is something outside of this realm, earth realm. It's not gonna, and this big rock comes. And it crushes this image, just literally crushes it, makes it like dust so that it can just be blown away by the wind like the chaff. That means it's these, whatever was contained, or whatever is represented by this image will not be remembered. And this big rock, big, uh, the rock becomes a big mountain, mountain. So that is the dream. 
So you can imagine Nebuchadnezzar wakes up, he remembers he has a dream. Now he, of course, he forgot what the dream is, but if, if, you, if you think this is what he had a dream, this is the dream he has. And everything in this dream is having a message, it's a, it's a, it has meaning. So God gives Daniel the interpretation of this. What was the interpretation? Each part of the image, what does each part of the image represent? As you can see, as Daniel interprets it, each part of the image is representing a kingdom. Or uh, we could use the word empire. Okay. So the gold part represents one kingdom, one empire. Next part, the, the chest silver represents another empire because he says, after you, verse 39, after you will arise another kingdom. So another empire. The, the waste made of bra brass or bronze represents another kingdom, another empire. And the feet of iron represents another empire which will arise after this. So what does Daniel say? What, or what is God speaking um, through this image? He is giving a sequence, of, uh, he's, he's giving history in, in advance, if you would like to say it that way. He's telling the king, and he's through, through this dream, of course, revealing it to the people. Here are the coming kingdoms. And there's going to come one other kingdom after this. Then there'll be another kingdom. Then there will be another kingdom. Now, what we understand about the the, the 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 kingdom that was of iron is the reason he's using iron is it's going to be very strong. You know, he says here, verse 40, as strong as iron, it's going to crush all others. Meaning, this particular kingdom, the iron king, is going to be very strong, very powerful. Then after that, what's going to happen after that? This Part of this iron kingdom will get mixed with the rest of the people of the earth, is what he's saying. Because that is representing the toes. That means this iron kingdom is, is in, in, in one way, is going to disintegrate, or it's going to become small, small, small pieces. And it's going to be mingled with people from every other part of the earth. That is the uh, toes here, verse 42. Or verse 41, 42. The kingdom shall be divided. It's become very, you know, species. And it's going to be mixed. Verse 43, it's going to mix with all the other people. And very significant, verse 44. In the days of these kings. That means uh, this, this disintegrated, broken down, mingled kingdom, when there are kings or leaders there, at that time, at that time, verse 44, God of heaven will set up his kingdom on the earth. So now he's talking about a fifth kingdom, which is a kingdom from heaven. You know? Uh, or, uh, yeah, or I should say maybe the sixth one, because if you look at that, the feet and the toes as a, another separate kingdom, starting from Babylonians, Babylonian, Medes and Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, another kingdom. Then in that time, God's kingdom will be set here upon the earth. Now, As I had mentioned earlier, the interpretation is contained right here within the same chapter. Right? Now, it's only a high level, it's meaning he's not given the names of these kingdoms. That will come later in the later chapters. But this dream, Daniel chapter 2, is like the framework for everything that is going to be revealed in the coming chapters in Daniel. So as we go through the remaining chapters, they're all an 
adding more details to each part of history, telling us you know which kingdom these kingdoms are, what's going to happen during those kingdoms, and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, so chapter two is like the outline. I'm giving you the outline, and I will start adding the details as we go into the future chapters. Right. So in this diagram that I'm that you're seeing on the screen. Um, uh, I've, I've mentioned the names of the empires, Babylonians, Medes, Persians, and all. That is not given in this chapter. The only detail that's, that we can say is in in verse 38, it says, you are this head of gold. So head of gold, we know. You are, okay, Babylonian. That is that is given to us. Hmm? The others are not given in this chapter. It will come in the future chapters. But in chapter 2, he says, what do we know? These are all representing kingdoms. Which are going to come one after the other. The first kingdom has been identified. Head of gold, it's you, Babylonian. Nebuchadnezzar, it's you, Babylonian kingdom, it's you. Other kingdoms, names not given. It's just saying, okay, it's coming like this. What we know is legs of iron, it's going to be a very strong kingdom, very powerful kingdom. Then that is going to be broken down into many, many small pieces. It is going to be mixed with all the other people of the earth, meaning people is going to become a very mixed area. And in, it is in that time that God will set up his kingdom. On. So that detail is given to us. So the kingdom of heaven on earth is going to take place. Right? Now, uh, 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 this is getting ahead of myself, but I just want you to think about this. Right? Um, the Roman Empire. And we will talk more about this. The Roman Empire, like we've mentioned in the, in the introduction, they started somewhere around 60 BC, and they continued up to about 14, 50 AD. Now, in between, they were divided, uh, and uh, and and one part, the eastern part of it, I think, yeah, uh, dismantled. Like, so one part of it lasted only till about 450 AD, but the other part of it continued till about 1458, which we had given in the introduction. That's the Roman Empire, which is this very strong empire. So the Roman Empire is of special interest to us. Why? Because Daniel said, after that empire, that will be broken down into small, small, small pieces. And it will be mixed with every with people from all other parts of the world. It will get mixed. And if you look at what is so, the Roman Empire sir, existed all around the Mediterranean. From Rome, Italy, which is modern day Italy, it extended west to almost all the way to the what is modern day spain covered a major part of europe modern day europe and it came across into asia which included a little bit of turkey covered alongside the mediterranean which included you know which includes israel and nations around it and part of northern africa so that was the Roman Empire at its height. It covered all that region around. So for us today, that region is of very of great interest. Why? Because Daniel said that region, that Roman Empire, would then be broken into small, small, small parts. And it will be mixed with all other people from the all other kinds of races of people. It will all be mixed. And that is what we are seeing primarily across the across Europe and, and these regions. When you look at Europe today, we have what is called as the European Union. But what it is, what is it made of? So all these little little, little countries. Small, small, small countries, all broken, you know, tiny, lots of countries. And these countries have people from just all 
you know, almost all parts of the world. The seed of men, like uh, people from everywhere, are living across Europe and across what was the former Roman Empire. So we are actually seeing uh, verses 41, 42, 43, we are actually seeing it happen before our eyes. So that's what Daniel said. It'll be the toes, the, the feet, it'll be iron mixed with clay. What used to be part of the former Roman Empire is now small, small, small countries lead, led by different leaders. And it's all mixed. There are people from almost different parts, of, I mean, many different parts of the world living in all these areas. And so we are living in the times of Daniel chapter, 40, Daniel chapter 2, verses 42, 43, and we are now ready for verse 44. Because he said, in the times, in the days of these kings, kings represents leaders, leaders who are heading up, you know, kingdoms or territories, countries. In the days of these kings, when you're seeing this happen, that's the time the God of heaven is going to come and set up his kingdom here on earth. So it's very, very interesting. And that's why we look at what's happening around Europe. And there are more details that are going to come in the future chapters that we go into. Right? Uh, so this chapter 2 is like an outline for all that is going to be revealed to us in the coming chapters. Let me pause before we go forward and see if there are any questions on chapter 2. Any questions on uh, chapter 2? Everyone? This together. Okay, John. John's question: um, Does this iron and clay have anything to do with democracy? Um, my my response to that would be, you know, it's a very good question. Good question, right? Um, my response to that would be, it is better to stay with the... Okay, so this actually sparks a, a thought that I, I, that I need to highlight. When we interpret text, let's pick up on the biblical typology that's being used. All right, so example. What does a mountain represent? What does a mountain represent? What will we think? So, may think of a mountain? Huge. Uh, sorry, John? Something very huge. Ah, huge. Now, uh, uh, based on what we are seeing in this text, what when we say mountain, what will it represent? Based on what is given in the text. So he says, you know, he says, verse 35, the stone became a great mountain. What Then what does he say about the mountain? Verse 44, God will set up a kingdom. So in our minds, we should start making in you know, our, our catalog. Mountain, so this is biblical typology, right? We're using Bible itself uh, to create a catalog of what do different images mean. Hmm? Mountain. What can it mean in the Bible? In the Bible it can mean a kingdom. How do we know? Because verse 35, that stone became a great mountain. What is the mountain? God will set up a kingdom. Verse 44. So a mountain represents kingdom. So we started kind of making our catalog, right? So similarly, um, we look at the text, and in the text, what does iron? What would I? What does iron represent? And what does clay represent? In the text. So, how did he interpret in verse forty-one? As strong as iron, iron representing strength and something that has a lot of. Uh, it was verse 40. I'm looking at verse 40. Like iron that crushes. So he's talking iron according to 
the context, the text, is representing strength and very, you know, very strong influence. What does clay represent? Uh, according to the text, verse 43, iron mixed with clay. And in the text, the clay is representing people from all races. That is verse 43. You see the iron mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men. All right. So the text is itself is giving us that what that image represents. Kingdom, uh, sorry, mountain image represents kingdom. Iron represents strength, influence. Clay represents seed of men, meaning people of all races. Okay, so we can start creating a catalog in our minds. Okay, this is prophetic imagery. When God is giving us these kinds of images, biblically, this is what they represent. Now, keep in mind that sometimes one image could have multiple meanings, right? That we're looking at the text, the text here. So according to the text, iron is signifying something very strong in its influence, uh, in the way it controls things. Clay is just talking about different uh, races, people. So my response to that question would be, uh, we will just stay with the meaning given to us in the text. And, uh, you know, I, I'm sure that when there are other people who are interpreting these things, they could say, okay, it represents, you know, uh, communism. Iron, rep iron could represent communism and clay can represent democracy. And, you know, they may, they may say some things generally, you know, uh, but it is outside of the text of scripture. And so we shouldn't go with that. It's okay to listen. The, the people will say lots of things. But if you stay with the text of scripture, the text itself is giving us a meaning for those images. Iron means this, clay means this, mountain means this, and each part of the image means this. So we will stay with that, uh, the meaning given to us in the text itself. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Go ahead, Jafina. I just want to make sure whether I'm understanding things right. So in verse, uh, you said 43 and 44 all the time that we are living in right now. And the kingdom uh, that's going to come, uh, I think, was, uh, yeah, when verse 44, the God uh, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. It's, it talks about the future, uh, I believe, until that I'm right. So um, when it says in verse 44, uh, the kingdom shall not be left to other people. And it says it shall break in pieces and consume uh, all these kingdoms. So what does this line mean? It's like whether the kingdom of God, uh, the heaven is going to be broken in pieces. And what are the kingdoms that it's going to consume? What What's the interpretation of this verse 44? That's what. Okay. So... Um, again, just think about the dream. There's this big rock coming and it's crushing the image. That means it's crushing all these previous kingdoms. And these previous kingdoms are removed. Right? They will not. So it is these. Uh, and the kingdom shall not be left. It shall break in pieces, consume all these kingdoms. So the kingdom of heaven is going to be so powerful that all these other kingdoms will be taken out of the way. They will not even be remembered. It's gone. So that is basically, so if you ask me what it is, it is the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. So when the Lord Jesus sets up his kingdom on the earth, he's going to rule and reign for 1,000 years on the earth. That is this kingdom that's coming from heaven. Which you know we will see in Revelation later on, Revelation chapter twenty. He will rule and reign for one thousand years. That means his kingdom will supersede all these other kingdoms. You know, uh, and as as a prophet of the increase of his government, 
Jesus and his dominion, there will be no end. So that's how great this kingdom will be. It will supersede all these other kingdoms, uh, all other previous kingdoms, the kingdom of God. So that's what he's saying in verse 44. Any other questions on chapter 2? Um, yes, Divya. Yeah, yes, Pastor. Um, I was uh, thinking about, uh, like most of these uh, prophecies in Daniel talk about uh, these four kingdoms, uh, the Babylonian, Medo-Persian, Greek, Roman, um, then about the kingdom of God. Um, so I was wondering, like, uh, in history, like, we do see the rise and fall of other empires, uh, but that's never mentioned. So yeah. is it because of, uh, was their scope uh, not like the other empires is it because of that or any any particular reason why these four kingdoms are specifically mentioned yeah good question um my response to that would be because uh, of the geograph geography on which these prophecies are focused so um as Daniel is prophesying, he's speaking primarily about the kingdoms that um, came one after the other around the Mediterranean. So he did not prophesy, like, like he said, there were many other empires and kingdoms in other parts of the other regions of the world. They, they came and went. But his main focus was on this region. Now, even within this region, we know that subsequent to the Roman Empire, in this region, there were much other smaller kingdoms that came and went. The, um, uh, the Seleucid Northern Southern Kingdoms, then came the Ottoman, and then the Turks, and uh, then uh, we see more recent world history when you know the Arab nations were established and so on. So in that part of the world. But I think the prophecies are concerning primarily primarily the region around the Mediterranean, that where the actual all this biblical context is. And he's speaking to us about what will happen there. And we also see in scripture that there is a gap from the Roman Empire, end of the Roman Empire, and then the transition goes to the end of the age. So that gap, because he's not talking about all the empires that came on after the Roman Empire. That gap is because the focus then changes to you know, what we refer to as the church age. So right now we are in the church age. So remember, around the time of the Roman Empire came the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus came, the church was born, the focus then changed now to the church age. So that's a gap of about 2,000 years. And then at the end of the church age, after the church is taken out of the way, raptured, the focus then changes back to Israel, which is uh, what we refer to as Daniel's 70th week. So the church age, the scriptures call it the times of the Gentiles. Focus has gone, changed from what's happening in and around Israel to what's happening around the world in reaching the Gentiles with the gospel, the times of the Gentiles, the church age. 
end of the church age, focus shifts back to Israel. The last seven years, that's referred to as Daniel's 70th week or um, the time of Jacob's trouble or uh, it's, it's, it's a focus on Israel. And then with that ends the, you know, all of the prophecies, all prophecies will be fulfilled and we are then ushered into the millennium. So for these two reasons, one is the geography that's involved. It's primarily what's happening around the Mediterranean. Second is because of the dispensation or the timeline of what the, the timeline is happening. Uh, the prophecies deal with primarily God's working with the people of Israel and how they are being affected. And so there's this big gap of about 2,000 years during which time we know that you know a lot of other things were happening in the Mediterranean, but the focus is on uh, the church age, a different dispensation. So I would you know look at it from both these perspectives. Yeah. Sure, thank you, Pastor. Okay, any other questions? All right, so. Um, so ch chapter two is kind of giving us, you know, like it's almost like an introduction or an outline to what's going to come. Uh, we skip chapters three and uh, we then just pick up one prophetic part, um, which uh, is in the end of chapter five. Um, so... Let me share the notes. So, uh, you know, I'm skipping the uh, the the events uh, that were taking that took place. You know, chapter uh, three, four, and five, and we are jumping into the prophetic portion of chapter five, just to give us a context here. So, by the time we come to chapter five. Um, the kings in the Babylonian Empire have come and gone. So we were there in chapter 2 when there was Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, then his son came on. And there were others who reigned. And we now come to Belshazzar, who is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar. So that's in chapter 5. So transitions have happened, short and brief periods. Belshazzar, who's a grandson of Nebuchadnezzar, is now in charge of the Babylonian Empire. Daniel is still there. And we now pick up things in Daniel chapter 5, verses 24 till verse 30. And Daniel 5, 24 to 30. So we're going to uh, read that, that passage. Daniel 5, uh, 24 to 30. It's another prophetic portion that we will read. And uh, uh, let's do the same thing. Let's uh, uh, take uh, two verses each. Keep, uh, different ones can read it. And then we will look at what the prophetic is here. Verse 24. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written, Mene Mene Tekel Uparsin. This is the interpretation of each word. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom has been divided and given to Medes and Persians. Okay. Somebody could um, rest. Verse 29. Then Belshazzar gave uh, the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. 
Okay, thank you. So, very interesting prophetic portion. So, just the background, some of us are familiar. Belshazzar was having a big, you know, celebration, big party, and in his, you know, with all of his important people at his court. And he was actually using the vessels that they had brought out of the temple in Jerusalem. And so it was all, all of this was going on. And while this was good, going on, a strange hand comes. There's a hand that comes and writes certain words. We're going to be going, we have this inscription recorded for us. And everybody's seeing it. The king is shocked. And they say, hey, okay, wise men, come. What is happening? Please, what is this meaning? What are these letters? What are these strange things written? What does it mean? Wise men are not able to interpret it. And somebody remembers Daniel. So, king, in the time of your grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, the wise man, interpreted it we need to ask him so they bring daniel and again you know this is god doing his work through daniel and daniel is prophesying he's interpreting what was written in the inscription and he's prophesying now this uh, this is just a note here that just as god in in chapter two god was using images he used the image of a uh, this big structure but made up of, of, a, of a person with different parts, metal parts, and the rock and the mountain. Here, very interestingly, God is using inscription or writing or letters. And each word is meaning something. So here again, something for us to learn. God can speak to us through images. God can speak to us through words. But every word is having big meaning. Right? And the interpretation is coming. So, you know, there's a message behind each word. Yeah. And Daniel is able to pre present that to the king. Basically, what he's saying is, king, your kingdom, you know, you have been found wanting. God has made you and you know you found lacking and your kingdom is going to be divided and this time he specifies the next kingdom so in chapter 2 he specified gold represents you babylonian he said your kingdom will be given to another kingdom but he didn't tell us the name of that but in chapter 5 he's telling the medes and the persians your kingdom is going to be given, that is verse 28. Your kingdom is going to be given to the Medes and the Persians. So he specified. This is what is the meaning of that inscription. And what is uh, you know so so interesting is verse 30. That very night the prophecy was fulfilled. The Medes came and overthrew. Uh, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, overthrew them. So, two things just to point out. Here in chapter 5, God is speaking through inscription of words. So sometimes when God is speaking to us, we also pay attention to words that are highlighted for us. Okay? It may be just two or three words or four words or five words. But it, there is a big message behind those words that are being impressed in, or given to us. In this chapter, Daniel is identifying the next kingdom, the Medes and Persians. They come, they will take over. He did not give a timeline, but it happened immediately. In this case, it was immediate fulfillment. And I've just given some, um, you know, just that background or the historical information. Uh, about what happens uh, to whatever you know uh, hi history have been people have been able to reconstruct uh, 539 BC uh, the Babylonian uh, Empire fell to the Medes and uh, Darius 
uh, was appointed uh, to to uh, to be in charge at that time. Uh, so okay, so we've covered two portions of prophetic text. What we are going to do next week is pick up from chapter seven. So at chapter six, we are not going to look at it. it's uh, it's, uh, it's an historical event which we are familiar with. Chapter seven onwards is prophetic text after prophetic text, every chapter. And it is all adding more and more details to the outline that was given to us in chapter two. And it'd be very interesting because so much, so, so much is unveiled to us in, in these coming chapters, Daniel chapter seven on. Okay. So we'll pick up chapter seven next week. Before we close today, any thoughts, any comments, any questions? All right. So I hope um, everyone's following and um, you're all seeing that um, Daniel can be understood. It's not very difficult. Step by step, little by little, we'll be able to uh, unravel uh, the prophetic text given to us in Daniel. Let's close in prayer. Somebody could pray with us as a class and dismiss us, please. Father, we want to thank you for this time of learning. We pray, O oh God, as we continue to learn from uh, this book, O oh God, we pray that you would reveal yourself to us and help us to understand it in the in the right context and help us to understand it in the right way. We pray, O oh God, that, uh, that this all these learnings would be beneficial for our personal walk with you and also with the people whom we are ministering to. We pray and ask for your grace to rest upon us, God. We thank you, God, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Amen. See you again next week. Bye now.